start handing in homework with their names on them, I'll get better at this. Okay, well, so you didn't know what you told me to talk about. I'm sure. No, I was. Uh, your name? Oh. Uh, I don't Two Daniels. There's Daniel McGill and L. Daniel L. Okay. Daniel McGill is not here. And uh, Juan Hoa. And Gong. And Israel. So this is a bad, bad precedent here. 
going to check next door, see if anybody is in the wrong place. I was just looking at the number. Said the new one was six? Yeah. That was the old one. All right. Okay, so uh, I know we went over this and I decided we didn't do a very good job. Uh, this was a problem where there were two things in it that we hadn't really discussed and some of you I'm sure went ahead and did what needed to be done. Uh, but I'd still like to be clear about it. Uh, if you don't know what this looks like, you could either use a graphing calculator or just use some. Uh, well, actually, it's pretty simple. You should kind of be able should be able to figure out what this looks like. It's these two parabolas, and uh, I didn't even notice it says it only it only cares about the first quadrant. So we want to know this area. But uh, we didn't really talk about how to find the area between two graphs. Uh, we also, we, we know that the interval is from zero to something. So we went over that really fast, and I thought that was a little too fast. So uh, how can we find out this? Point or rather the, uh, the x coordinate. And uh, I, I think the obvious thing to do is uh, find the point where these two are equal, which would be the point where x squared equals minus x squared plus 8, which is a rather simple should be rather simple algebra to figure this out, right? This is 2x squared equals 8, or x squared equals 4, or x equals plus or minus 2. And uh, the plus or minus should you know, you immediately say, aha, that's the minus 2 and plus 2, but I don't care about that anyway, right? So what's left is the question, OK, so we know that here. So what's left is, uh, how do we do this? We, we only know how to figure out the area underneath the curve, not between two curves. And uh, I think most of you probably done enough geometry to know that it's not a big deal. You just take the area underneath this parabola. We add that up, and then we just want to subtract the area under this parabola, this one here. And so how do we do that? Well, this parabola is this one, negative x squared plus 8. And then if we subtract this one minus x squared, that's the function we want to integrate with our, this is with our calculator now, from here to here. And that will give you the right answer. Any questions about that? I mean, since you guys clearly represent the, the intelligentsia of the class, because you showed up, you probably didn't have too much trouble with it. But, uh, yes. Uh, I was just wondering if it was possible to find the area by doing like negative x squared plus 
four and then finding the area under that and then time multiplying it by two, or would that not work? Okay, I kind of went through me. I, I, I got as far as this. What does this represent? <laughs> Sorry? What does this represent? Uh, just half of the area of the... Okay. Or so... Up to where they intersect. So, again, that is a parabola. Uh, if we have, this is eight, right? And your parabola is <coughs> kind of here, right? Mm -hmm. And you're saying, go ahead, tell me what, what you were going to do with it. Well, what was the rest? Uh, let's find the area between uh, negative x squared plus 4 and then multiply it by 2. Hmm. Does that look like? Well, only if it equals the, I mean, the two parabolas are like symmetric uh, lines. I'm not, I'm not saying no because I don't really understand the whole thing yet. <laughs> um, you're 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 trying. I think what you're trying to do is say, uh, I know from geometry about similarity, right? Um, all parabolas with the same coefficient on the x are similar. Yeah. All right, I got that far. I'm, you know. Here's kind of a very, very bad way to investigate this, right? Which is, look at the answer using this, and then look at your answer, and if they're the same, you probably are on the right track, or you're being fooled by a coincidence. <laughs> but I, I, if you want to come up and explain it. Oh, no, I'm good. <laughs> are you sure? We have time. No, it's OK. Um, uh, there's certainly. Uh, I mean, I'm certainly tempted to look at these two and think, well, the, uh, you know, well, the proportion's the same, but this is twice as big, so maybe this is four, four times the area? I don't know. Maybe. Um, okay. Any, any other questions about this? Okay. Now is a good time if you have questions about either the handout, any of the problems on the handout, or any of the homework problems. If you'd like to talk about any of those. Um, I don't have the assignment front of but I do remember it was section 5.1. Any of those problems? Definition two. Definition two. What are talking about? The area A of a region that lies under the graph of the continuous function is the limit of the sum of the areas of the approximating rectangles. So some kind of physics class, I'm sure. It's like, this is accelerating at like 10 gravity. Here. It's just not what I wanted to do. Let's see. I just have to add a little friction. There we go. So this area says, this definition says, area is the limit, 
as Anne approaches infinity of r sub n, and then he goes on a little to say that's the limit and approaches infinity of f of x1 times, you know, I'm not going to write it this way because I know how to remove a factor, f of x2 all the way up to f of xn times delta x. Okay, so there's our definition of area. Um, you know, as long as I'm going to violate the terms of uh, the book, I should explain why. Uh, this is a correct definition. It is true. It's not the one that mathematicians use, because mathematicians aren't interested in the area under a continuous function. Mathematicians are interested in the area under a function that's mostly continuous, but can have some breaks in it. So, for example, I said, uh, you know, what's the area under this function, right? You know, from, say, here to here, A to B. I mean, you wouldn't want to have to panic and go, oh my gosh, it's not continuous, I can't do it. But uh, this definition does work if you have a continuous function, so be that as it may. So 22a says, use the definition to find an expression for the area under the curve y equals x cubed from 0 to 1 as a limit. All right, so I want to say y equals x cubed. So, okay. So let's just fill in here. So limit as n approaches infinity of well, what's f of x1? It's x1 cubed plus x2 cubed plus x to the n cubed times delta x, which we so you say what its limits are? Zero to one. Zero to one, okay. So if, uh, you know, this is my graph here. So this is what x cubed looks like on that side. So from 0 to 1, right, it's interval 0 to 1, uh, what is my delta x equal to? 1 over n. 1 over n. Everybody see how does everybody see how I got one over n? I'm just dividing my delta x's are just these little pieces. The length is one, and they're n of them, so each one of them is length. Delta x is one over n. Okay, so that 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 answers part a, which you presumably already got, or you're not worried about. Then it says, the following formula for the sum of the cubes of the first n integers is proved in appendix F. Use it to evaluate the limit in part A. So, uh, I'll read that again. Use it to evaluate the limit in part A. All right, let's see what, I mean, So what we have is the sum of n cubed, n equals, I'm going to use i cubed here, i equals 1 to n is n times n plus 1 equal to squared. By the way, uh, tell me your name. Uh, you guys, anyone here not, I don't know if that's the right question, uh, there are a lot of like uh, formulas like this, like the sum of the first n or the sum of the squares. Do you guys 
do this either in high school or in a previous math class. Prove, remember how you prove these? What's the name of the type of proof? Inductive proof. Uh, inductive. Inductive proof. Okay. All right, I just, you know, just want to keep away from another. Okay, so what does this have to do with this? Oh. Well, we somehow want to get this to look like this. Right? Now that's, that seems a little odd, doesn't it? Right? Because these are, I mean, you got indexes here, but they don't mean anything. So we have to we have to figure out some way to transform this a little. It's a hard problem, isn't it? Anybody get this? Oh, okay, good. Somebody. All right, so let's let's take a close look at that interval here. We're looking at it's from zero to n, and we break it up into n of these delta x. And each x is 1 over n, right? So, like from here to here is from 0 to 1 over n, and then we have from 1 over n to 2 over n, and so forth. All the way to n minus 1 over n. Okay, how can we make these distances look like the sum from 1 to, should be using the same letter, well, I don't know, when do I say M? That's confusing. How can I make this look like, maybe I have some stuff. Well, what's, what's the length of each of these? One over n. Right? So if we were to take out that one over n, right, we'd say the length of this guy is one over n times one, and the length of this one is one over n times one, and so forth. In other words, we just kind of scale it by one over n. So let's see if we can, oh, I can see my physics experiment was definitely a mistake. Okay, so uh, I want to take this, right, which is, uh, I'm sorry, this, which is now, So let's take a, a, another 1 over n out of each of these. Right. Well, what, what did we say what, uh, x1 is? I'm dividing it by hand. What is what is x one? I don't do this. That's that's what I want to do. Uh, I want to make this instead of from. I'm going to say that quite clearly. This is just going to drift off into nowhere. There it goes. See if we can't uh, can't put some heat on it here. All right. Uh, can do this. Mm -hmm. 
I think I think I'm just going about this the wrong way. I think I just want to plug in, right? I think there's an example on the page. I think I just want to plug in here. Yeah. That would be cheating. Limit is n approaches infinity of. All right. Well, what is x one? This is the length of x one. It, it's one over n. So one over n cubed over n, right? And x two is. Yeah, I was trying to be too too fancy here. Uh, actually, the n doesn't belong there. Sorry. That's it. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, these are the cubes, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one cube. Well, we don't want to write it that way, do we? Want to write n cubed over n. Thank you. Okay. And then that times one over n. All right. Well, let's take out the n cubed from this. So this is limit n approaches infinity of 1 cubed plus 2 cubed plus 3 cubed plus n cubed. Well, now I have to bring it out here, right? So now I have 1 over n to the 4th. All right, well, now my formula does me some good because I can replace that sum with n over n plus 1. Two squared, is that what it was? Yeah. Two and the whole thing squared times one over n to the fourth. Which I'm going to put inside here, right, is n squared. And now we want the limit of that as n approaches infinity. Okay, that was the hard part, right? Now we just have to evaluate this limit. Anybody want to help you with that? Okay, I have to ask if you have a problem with figuring out this limit. Something else. Total silence. I'll assume that means somebody is a little unsure. So we probably want to rewrite this as n squared plus n over. 2n squared squared. And then I think it would be a good idea to break it up into a fraction. Right. I'm just going to put a big L there to remind you this limit. So that's 1 half plus 1 over 2n. And we want to see what happens to this as it goes to n goes to infinity. Is that clear? It should be really clear. Other questions? Um, look, I have a question. Oh, do you have a question? Yeah. For either 20 or 21, uh, I'm not really sure how to, like, or what to put in for those ads. Oh. Either 20 or 21. Determine a region whose area is equal to the given limit. Not determine the limit. So they want you to kind of work backwards now, right? In other words, the other problem said, well, you know, what does this sum look like if I give you some function? What does the function look like if I give you the sum? Okay. 
but it's the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum of i equals 1 to n of 2 over n times i plus 2i over n so, we're looking for some function. I'm just going to guess it's it gets big quickly, right? Because you've got a 10 in there. We want to know what that function is. Of x equals. So what looks like the delta two x in this? Two, two over the n, right? This looks like it, maybe it's from zero to two, right? Broken up into n parts. So you're just gonna say delta x equals 2 over n. And then, if that's the delta x, this has to be the function. So what does the function look like? Looks like 5 plus x sub i. sub i to the 10th. So that's what the sum looks like. So the function just has to be 5 plus x to the 10th. Does that sound right? Yeah. No, it's just bounded on 0 to 2. I'm sorry? It's bounded on the region from 0 to 2. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, from 0 to 2. Yeah. OK. Kind of thinking backwards. I have a suspicion that I have to investigate here. My suspicion is that there's an assignment out there, and it wasn't the one I gave. No, I don't want to give that assignment. OK. That's right. Been a lot of rearranging in the last few days, so. OK. Um, other questions on homework? So what was the final answer for number 20? I'm sorry, you have a question about 20. Yeah, what was the final answer? Uh, determine a region whose area is equal to the given limit. Oh. So you would say it's the integral from 0 to 2 of x plus 5 to the 10. Um, I got something completely different. OK. Uh, you, you want to tell me what it is? Yeah, um, so I did delta x equals to 2 over n, and then f of x is x to the 10. And xi equals to 5 plus 2 over okay, so i. You're, you're, oh, sorry. You're just faster than me. Sorry. I'm slow. What was the other part? f of x equals to x to the 10th. f of x. f of x. Equals x to the 10th. Okay. And then xi. Okay. Equals to 5 plus 2i over n. And then from that we can we know that a equals five. And then hold, hold, hold on, I'm just absorbing this. So I mean this sounds like we want to start at an offset of five. Is that right? Yeah. But I think it tells us I think the question is asking where the interval is located. Ah, 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 yeah, you know, I think that what 
you gave is what they want. Oh. But I don't think it's any more correct. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, so, I'll, I was just wondering what the answer is. No, no, I think, you, I think your answer is correct. Okay. Right? I, I think here's the way to think about it. Uh, the tent, that's going to go up in the other direction, right? So what if I do a transformation on this function? I'm going to redraw it here. Uh, I don't want that there. Let's put this line here. Okay, so uh, take my, my version where it's at zero, right? And now move the axis this way five. So now this is the origin, right? And I was saying, well, between here and here is the area, right? Does it matter whether the axis, the origin is here, oh, so or the origin is five. here, as long as you adjust the interval? Okay. I think that's what happened. Okay, I see. I know I get what you were Does saying. that make sense? Yeah, okay. Everybody understand? So do you just add five to your final answer? And then? Well, no, no. Um, uh, so your XR would be zero, two, and then add five. Oh, see what I'm doing is I'm adding the 5 in in the function and using a difference interval. I'm using from 0 to 2, right? And so, like, for example, the first, the first guy in this uh, sum is 5 to the 10th. What you're doing is you're saying the function is, you know, f of x to the 10th is f of x is x to the 10th, right? But from the interval 5 to 7. So your first item in the sum is 5 to the 10th. It's just we're just shifting, oh, okay. we're just shifting the axis over. Okay. So uh, that suggests an interesting point, which is how many, how many solutions are there to that problem? Correct solutions. Infinite, yeah. No. Um, okay. Different people will look at it different ways. You, you, you obviously. I think it's obvious you looked at it the way they wanted you to. Okay. Well, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't mind repeating myself. Any other questions on the homework? Okay. Uh, if you've done the homework, you may hand it in. You can wait till the break or whatever. If you haven't finished it, please don't do it while class is going on. Please do it and bring it in next time. Don't worry about it. Okay? All right. Are we good? Are we good to go? All right. I'm going to clean up here. I don't know what I'm going to do. I guess I have to write an email to somebody about this uh, wonderful piece of technology here. I really do want to try and keep my scribblings to the center right now because there being so so many people not here, I think that maybe this video may help. Not maybe maybe they'll just fail or something. One of those things. Okay. Um, just give up on this board and just use two boards. Other work. Okay, so uh, I want to first show you two examples of something. We're, we're moving. We're moving towards the question of how to you how do you evaluate an integral such as a to b of f of x dx. We're moving in that direction. 
So uh, the first thing I want to show you is a very simple example. If f of x equals c, constant. So here's c. Here's a and here's b. And I want to know the area under this curve from A to B. Well, the area clearly is B minus A times C. The... Would you mind using a different pen? Cause... Yeah, I was about to. Okay. <laughs> Nobody panicked. Take care of it on the way out. There's no garbage <laughs> pail in here, right? Oh, what is the There's no garbage pail. <laughs> Trust me, that I It's not in the other room either. Okay, shall I. Uh, is this better? Oh, yeah. Can you repeat what you did before? Okay. I'm simply saying we're interested in how to evaluate these without using our calculator or doing limits. And I'm drawing the function here. It's very easy to draw. It's constant. That's the function we're going to look at right now. And I'm looking at the area between A and B. So of course, the area of a rectangle is length times width. The width is B minus A, and the length C. Now, uh, I could write this, I'm going to use some new notation that we will run into. I'm going to write this as XC from A to B. Now, I want it clear what this means. This means I plug in B, B times C, and I subtract the same thing plugging in A, which of course is B minus A times C. Um, this notation just says I want to evaluate this expression from A to B, so of course I'm going to plug in B first and subtract A. Another almost identical uh, way you might see this is like this from A to B. Okay? That's just a little notation. So I want you to think about uh, for a second. Some function. I want you to think of this as a function, right? And I'm going to give it the name capital F of X from A to B. So what is what is F of X then? some hand waving. I want you to notice that the derivative of this function is c, which is exactly the function I'm finding the area for here. This is so simple I can see how it might be confusing. Is everybody on board here? I've done, you know, I'm just I'm making a big deal out of finding the area of a rectangle. Right. Now, I'm going to do this once more, only a little more complicated. Uh, the next function I'm going to look at is f of x equals x. So 
So this is what that looks like. Just a straight line. And now I am A, I am B. I have to think for a second. How am I going to figure out the area of this? Well, since this is f of x equals x, this point is b, b, and this point is a, a. And now just take a look at this big triangle, you know. What's the area of this big, big triangle here? It certainly is. Okay, now if I take that triangle and I subtract this little triangle, I'm going to get the area. So what's the area of that little triangle? A squared over 2. Okay, so that's the area, right? Now I'm going to write this, again using my notation, as x squared over 2 from a to b. And again, I want you to look at that function f of x equal x squared over 2, and I want you to think, what is the derivative of that function? It's just plain old x, which just happens to be the function that I have here. Now, if any of you have taken calculus before, you'll You'll say, well, I know where it's going. This is really tedious. But not everybody, not everybody sees this right away. So we looked at two functions, and we found that by out evaluating their antiderivative, and then evaluating from A to B, that you know the difference between those, we end up with the area. Now, there's a little micro point here. You might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. x. If I'm an antiderivative of x, and I get x squared over 2, right? No, right? No. What? What do I get? What's the antiderivative of f of x equals x? x squared over 2. Plus. Ah, thank you. Okay, f, f of x equals x squared over 2 plus c. Well, that's okay because remember what this means. It means evaluate f of b minus f of a, which is b squared over 2 plus c minus a squared over 2 minus c. That extra constant we're always getting when we're integrating, well, if we subtract here, the constant goes away. So that, that's not a problem. All right, so the proposal is maybe the way to evaluate this integral is to find the function f, the derivative of, of which is f of x, it's the antiderivative, and then evaluate it at the two limits, f of b 
minus f of a. That would mean that all this stuff we've been learning up till now about antiderivatives is going to come in useful. It also means all that stuff about Riemann sums and delta x's and whatever is just a kind of a stepping stone that we, we won't have to go back to. Okay, well that would be that would be great if that were true. But we only showed it in two very, very limited cases. And we want to see that that's generally true. And how can we do that? That's hard. This is hard. And we could try to solve it for hmm? all powers of x. Yeah, if we could do it in general, it's going to work for all powers of x sines and cosines and exponentials and everything we've done. All right? So uh, we're going to do it. We're going to see why this is. We're not going to do a formal proof that would pass muster. But that's not the purpose. The purpose is, see, how, how does this show up? Why is the kind of the area the opposite of finding the derivative? Right? Why is that? And uh, I have to say, for probably 30 years, 40 years, no, it's been a lot longer. Yeah, it's been a long time. I always knew this was true, I just didn't see it. And then somebody showed me, oh, you can do this, and it's like, there it is. Okay. All right, but it's, it, it's, this is hard, so you, everybody, everybody get their, Everybody got their coffee running in their veins, All right? Okay. All right. You can you can kind of relax for a minute while I clean up the board. So like I say, this will be a little challenging. This is also my favorite part of the class because once you understand this, everything else is just mechanics. It's just like algebra. You can do it. Okay. First thing I want you to do is to consider a function, f of x, defined as follows. It's the integral from a to x of we use a different variable here, f of t dt. Remember, this is a dummy variable. It goes away when you evaluate. But since I don't have a constant on my limit, this is a function. This is a little different from what we were doing. We're always, we always look at uh, this definite, inter definite integral as the area under a, under a curve from between two points. But now, uh, there's my function, I have an a, but uh, the other point, x, you know, can move around. So this is a function. Now, I want you to consider a limit. I want you to consider the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Everybody should look at that and <coughs> immediately go, aha, I know what that is. What is that? That's the derivative of f of x. What's, yep. Let's look at a diagram of what this looks like. We have some function, f of x, we have some point here, x, and very close to it we have some point, 
x plus h. So this is f of x here. And over here we have f of x plus h. So this is, you know, kind of a rectangle, almost. It's not quite a rectangle. Uh, it's more like a trapezoid, right? There's some point in the middle that's the average. Right? So the area of that is approximately f of x plus f of x plus h. over 2 times what? H. 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 And as H gets smaller and smaller, what happens to this approximation? It gets better and better, right? Here we have function of x, function of x plus h. As these come together, those two get closer and closer to the same thing, f of x. Okay. So we could say the limit of x of f of x plus f of x plus h over 2 times h is, is the area. Right? All right. Uh, now what I want to do is I want to plug in to this expression this expression. So let's look at that. Limit is h broke to 0 of integral from a to x, f of t dt minus the integral from a to x plus h of f of t dt all over So, think about what this integral is. This is the integral from some point A to here. Ah, I did it wrong. Sorry. It's plus h. So this, this first piece is the area from here to here. And the second piece is the area from here to here. So the difference is just this area here. So this limit is really just the same as this limit. Right? 
So what did, what did we decide that this limit was? This limit is the derivative of the our function f of x, which is equal to It's equal to the area under this curve. plus h plus f of x over 2. If h goes to 0, what does this go to? This is really, really simple. Just to stare at it for a second. f of x plus h plus f of x over 2. If h goes to 0, what is that limit? That's just f of x. Right? So we start over here the derivative of big F is this expression, which is, you can see, is the difference in these areas, which is clearly just F of X. So let me, let me write that as the first part of the fundamental, I guess I should write this out fundamental theorem of calculus. We know we're onto something when we've got the fundamental theorem, right? It says that the derivative of this function This is not the useful part. Although it does tell you if you have a function which gives you the area, or you want to find a function which gives you the area, if you, you know, under some curve, f of x, if you find the derivative of that expression, you should just get f of x back. Right? So this is part one. Part two tells us that we can now evaluate this interval, f of t dt, as our antiderivative at b minus our antiderivative at a. This is the second part of our fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, all this other stuff worked for you, and you can kind of see right here that, you know, that the expression that causes this thing to, you know, collapse into just f of x is exactly the derivative of this antiderivative function. If you can see that, that's where it comes from, good. So, this is kind of the pearl of wisdom you need 
we need to keep in mind for, for the next part of the class. All right? Now I'm going to be repetitive here, but I just want this very clear. If you have some function under a curve between two points, we can figure out that area, the area under that function, by taking the antiderivative of the function, evaluating it at the end point, and subtracting the value of the start point. Okay, relax for a second. Is there any questions about this? All right, well, let's, let's, let's do an example. Let's do an example over here. What if I wanted to find the integral? I'm trying to do something that uh, looks a little trickier than what we've done. 2 to 4 of x squared dx. Words. I've got a parabola and I want to evaluate the area under that curve between two and four. What does this tell me I need to do? I need to find any derivative of this. What's the any derivative? Now we're going to evaluate this between a and b, which is just b cubed over 3 minus a cubed over 3. That was awful simple, wasn't it? Yeah. I thought calculus was going to be hard, right? That's pretty simple. Okay. Let's do another one. the area between, well, let's just say f of x is the cosine of x, and I want to know the area under this curve between pi over 3 and pi over 2. Okay? In other words, I want this integral. Somewhere in here I have a green sheet. Ask me after class and we'll catch you up with things you might have missed. Okay. Uh, we want to evaluate this between pi over 3 and pi over 2. So this is just the sine of pi over 2 minus the sine of pi over 3. Uh, just to draw a little diagram here. There's my sine curve. Pi over 2 is here. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. 
I over 3 is somewhere around here, and I just look at this. Okay, uh, does everyone know what the sine of pi of 2 the yeah. sine of pi over 2 is? Exercises, um, but if I pass these out, find them. No, they are okay. Good. Uh, I just want to make a note about this. This is really great. We can find the area under any curve that we can find the antiderivative of. But you can't always do that. Uh, there are some functions that don't have any derivatives. In fact, they're very. There's some functions that are crazy. So. For example, f of x equals 0, x is irrational, and 1 if x is not irrational. So let's say I wanted the integral of f of x between 0 and 1. All right, so what does that look like? I don't know what it looks like. It's kind of like fuzzy. I mean, it looks like maybe it's a rectangle, or maybe not. But you can't find the antiderivative of this function. So that's out. There also are some functions which, I mean, I, I don't even know if, you know, what is the area of this? It's like, it's, it's like a, like a fish tank and the water can evaporate or something. I don't really know what to do with it. But there's some functions that clearly do have an area. Uh, I'm just going to draw my artist impression of a function. They clearly do have an area. You can pick some kind of points. But we, we, you're not going to be able to find an angle derivative. For example, uh, f of x equals e to the minus x squared. Um, does anybody recognize that function from anywhere? It's unfortunately, uh, it comes up a lot in business and statistics. This is a normal, called a normal function or normal curve. Normal distribution curve. Normal distribution curve, yeah. So it'd be nice to have a way to integrate this. Um, 
There are also some functions where uh, we're not quite sure yet what to do with them. For example, uh, what if I said 1 over x squared? And I want to integrate that from, say, I want to start at 0 because that's it's too complicated right now. But uh, I want it from 0, and I just want to know the area out here out to infinity. We don't know how to do that yet. We'll, we will learn about how to do that. Um, you still have zero there. Oh, thank you. One. Okay. All right. Let me uh, let me hand this out. Um, these these get progressively harder, and when it starts to, to ache, you'll have to let me know. <laughs> By the way, if anyone it's nice to have a coffee class. It's 244. Well, we should take a break. So you, you have a choice. You can take a break. Or not take a break. I'm going to show you some stuff so you can approach the bench, please. Uh, let's see, where's my. There's nothing secret. Do you have um, 
Did you take one A? Um, at the Global Global Course at Clinton Law. Oh, okay. And Clinton Law and Boston Law. Okay. Okay, that's fine. How do you know him to the East? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Yeah, that's right. I'm not sure. So I'm going to. Not, not that it's a problem. I mean, it's a I'm going to throw this out. So, you know, they're in a quarter system here. The first quarter was derivatives up through the end. And I think you have the book. You get people from the bookstore. And then the second quarter is mostly integration. Okay. So on the website, your map 1B, mm -hmm. and the first thing you should take a look at is the green sheet, mm -hmm. which tells you the grading policy and other things. Do you have a graphing calculator here? Okay. So for the final four tests, it has to be like an 83 or 84 or an 82. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, well, uh, you can take a look at it. Most of it's pet dog. Uh, on here, this is the homework assignment they are turning in today. And this will be the assignment for next Tuesday. Right. I'm sorry? I'll just do that for next Tuesday. Okay, yeah. And uh, you'll notice I have here lesson plans. These are not like the book. This is just my own notes, which you can look at. And so you can look and see what I did last week, along with uh, <laughs> taking attendance and going over, you know, this stuff. I actually, you know, you can see what we did. So you can use that to catch up. Um, I actually put a video. I have a video of it. I'll, I'll put it up online. It'll be over here on YouTube. It'll take a day or so. See, uh, um, there's none, none there yet. But um, it's not very good quality. But if you want to look at it, I'll put it up and you can look at it. And, and then the class handouts, you can also, you can also download these. Uh, this is what I handed out uh, Tuesday for people to work on. And you can do that. All right. Okay. I, you know, if I have another student, okay. not enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me know if you know, like, 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 Oh yeah, uh, that's that's how you do it. I mean, if you're registered at the school, you can use that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. So this was the first assignment, okay. and then this will be the assignment for next Tuesday. Tell me your name again. Thank you.
You are encouraged to work together on this. This is not test or homework. Like you had a question before, did it get answered? Yeah, because I checked my email and then you sent me the ad code. So. Oh, okay, all right. So that kind of answered. Okay, you're Daniel McGill. Yes. Okay.
cancel. That's of no importance. And yes, uh, this is my antiderivative. So again, uh, x minus 1 equals 3 halves over 3 halves, or times this, from 1 to 2. Now, if you had a little trouble with that one, you probably have more trouble with number 5 and number 6. What I would suggest you do with those is try and work your way backwards. Just try and guess. So for example, with number 5, which wants you to find the antiderivative of this very ugly looking thing, x times x squared minus 1 to the fourth, you take a guess and say, well, I wonder what the derivative, I wonder what the derivative of x squared minus 1 to the fifth is. Well, that would be 5 x squared minus 1 to the fourth times the derivative of that, times 2x. So that's 10x x squared minus 1 to the fourth, which is not what I want. But it's close enough that I can get there. Does that, does that help any? through the first three? Everyone's done the first three? Are there any other questions on the first three? No. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you work on, you know, you can take this home if you want and work on five and six are a little harder. Uh, you can see if you can do those. Um, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more now about this so that you're prepared for the homework assignment. Okay. Uh, I'm going to point something out. Uh, you may recall that. Uh, from first semester that the derivative of the derivative of the sum is what? It's the sum of the what? Just like 
three different functions, you know, x squared, x, and then 5, we can add them all together. And we, we can see that this is just the derivative of x squared plus x, the, derivative, the integral of from a to b of x squared plus x plus 5 dx. Right? It's just a more complicated function, but the area under it is the sum of these areas. Now what if, instead, I said, well, minus x. And what if I went backwards and said, OK, the integral from a to b of minus x, well, this is going to have a negative impact on the area. So what does it mean? What does that mean? If I have a function like this, a to b, looks like this, what does it mean to say the area under this curve? Well, clearly for this, this to work out right, this has to make a negative contribution. In other words, we're treating area, this area, not because it's below the axis, but because from this function to the axis is in the wrong direction. This is negative area. So, for example, I had, uh, I had a function like this. Uh, y equals x cubed minus 6x. It's going to look like this. So if I integrate from zero to some, some point on here. Until I get to here, all the contributions are negative. Once I get to here, now the contributions are positive. Right? But we have to be prepared for this idea that you could have negative area. Now you might say, well, what if that's not meaningful to my problem? I'll give you a real simple example. If I were to integrate from 0 to 2 pi sine of x, right? Right? there's 2 pi, there's 0. What do you think, the, what do you think this integral is going to be equal to? It's going to be 0, right? This, this part of the function is completely symmetric with this below the line. So later on in the class, we, were gonna, we will look at uh, this kind of integral, where we say there is 2 pi absolute value of sine x dx. Now what that would do here is that we just take this and kind of go like this. And now we would expect a positive, positive area. There are circumstances where that makes sense in the, you know, it's typically an application where negative area doesn't make any sense. Okay. Um, you might want to take a few notes here. There's a few important features of this integral that I'm going to go over. Some of these will come up on homework. So, and most of them are pretty straightforward. Um, first one is if I integrate from a to a of f of x dx, you would tell me what you think that would have to be. Zero, zero. That would have to be zero, okay. Very simple. Hmm? Question? No. No. Okay. Now, if I compare 
integral of f of x dx from a to b, I want to compare it with the same function, same interval, but in the opposite direction. Some ideas on how they would compare one is the name of the other. Exactly right. When you, you know, we arbitrarily kind of decide that if you have some function and you're going in the positive direction on the x-axis, that's positive area. But if you're going in the negative direction, then that's negative area. Okay? So this is useful. Um, the next guy I already, already kind of hinted at, we were already using it. I have two functions. I have a function which is uh, the sum of two functions. That's just equal to the sum of the integrals of these done separately, right? So if I have a function which is the sum of two functions, f and g, and I take an integral over some interval, I can separate it. Okay? I can do these separately. And uh, essentially when we compute these, that's what we're doing. Um, this also works, of course, just as well if it's some difference. There's a negative in there. Um, another, uh, I guess I'm going to draw a little diagram. If I have some, some function, uh, f of x, and I merely multiply this by some constant, let's say by 2. Uh, what would happen to the integral? It will just double it, that's right. In other words, you can take the constant outside of the interval. The next one is actually really important, especially with respect to functions that aren't continuous. Which is, uh, say I have a function which kind of jumps around. Uh, or let's say f of x is I don't know, something like. From 0 to 1, it's uh, x squared, and from 1 to 2, it's x cubed. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we can say that the, the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x dx is just the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx plus integral from 1 to 2 of f of x dx. But in this particular case, that makes, makes this very doable, because now this is just the integral of 0, 1 of x cubed of x squared, and this is from 1 to 2 of x cubed. So in other words, we can break this up. We find the area of this piece, and then we can find the area of this piece. And uh, that's what this next formula says in very general terms. It says the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal integral from a to c of f of x 
dx plus the integral from c to b of f of x dx. It just says we can break it up that way. Now, uh, you might you might have a thought here. Pause. Say, Wait a minute. That's that's great. That's great. That's great if a is here and b is here and c is here, right? But what if what if like c is over here or c is over there? And it turns out it still is true. Because if we were to go, say, from A to C and we're going backwards, that's negative area. And then we, when we go forward again, back from C to A, that negative area is gets removed. So, uh, very fundamental formula here for integrals. Okay, uh, that's, that's all the straightforward stuff. There are a couple, a couple more things you need to know uh, that involve inequalities, and they're they're very they're very intuitively obvious. Uh, if f of x is greater than or equal to zero on some interval a b. You know, for all x on a, b, then you can be assured that the integral from a to b, f of x, dx, will also be greater than or equal to zero. That is, if I know my function is above the axis between a and b, then I know my error is going to be positive. Uh, the opposite also works. If f of x is always less than zero, then the interval will be negative. Uh, and then, uh, similarly, if we can if we can bound f of x between a maximum and a minimum, then we can bound the integral by a rectangle, b e minus a times m, little m, and this is kind of like what we were doing earlier, where we, were, we had an upper approximation and a lower approximation. So the idea here is, if you have some function, and it has an upper bound and a lower bound, then you know this area below the function is a lower bound, and then the rectangle that contains it is an upper bound. Now, that might seem a little obvious, but uh, as you will see in the uh, homework assignment, it's sometimes a useful thing, useful to know. So. Okay, uh, you have a few more minutes to work on the problems. I'm still here for questions.